want to bring into the conversation our friend, legal analyst, Nima Rumani, uh, who we've re really been relying on to help us make sense of uh, each day of these proceedings. He joins me. Uh, Nima, thanks for being with us yet again here. Um, you and I were discussing quite a lengthy timetable when it comes to jury selection this very time yesterday. Does it surprise you that uh, at our conversation now, seven jurors have already been selected and seated. Uh, they have, what, about five more permanent jurors to go, six for alternates. This is moving along quite rapidly. Would you agree? Oh, I agree. What a difference a day makes. Yesterday, I was sitting here critical of Judge Merchant and how slow the process was going. And we didn't make any progress yesterday. And today, we did the work of multiple days in one day. So I give credit to the judge moving things along quickly, not entertaining frivolous motions, getting rid of jurors that clearly don't want to be there, and impaneling seven jurors already. So really big day in terms of uh, jury selection, no question. Okay, so uh, Nima, I have in my hand the juror questionnaire, uh, and this is 40 plus odd some questions that these potential jurors are, are being asked, and I want to read some of them because I think it's, um, I just think it's interesting, you know, what, uh, you know, the judge and the prosecution of the defense have decided on. Uh, this one specifically, which of the following print publications, cable and or network programs or online media like websites, blogs or social media platforms do you visit, read or watch? And then there's a list of so many outlets, uh, you know, in the media uh, that, you know, some of these potential jurors will check off that they either read, listen to, or watch. Is that standard or is that something that is, you know, a deviation from the, uh, you know, standard juror questions, would you say? This is not standard at all. And the judge wouldn't allow them to, the parties to ask, are you Republican, Democrat, independent? Uh, you know, what's your voting record? But really, I think the party said, well, maybe this is a way where we can glean some information about these potential jurors. And they were all over the place. We had Fox. Uh, hopefully, they're watching live now Fox. But we had everything from the major cable news networks to blogs to podcasts to print media. Um, some of the jurors were all over the place. So I don't know how much information the parties really gained from asking this question, but they clearly thought it was helpful um, because they wanted it and the parties agreed to it. But a lot of the jurors got information from what I would consider traditionally liberal as well as traditionally conservative media outlets. Okay, I want to go over yet another juror question, because I think this is important. Yes, it's interesting, but uh, we haven't really reported on these or seen these. One of them, this is question 30. Have you ever considered yourself a supporter or belonged to any of the following? The QAnon movement, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, the Boogaloo Boys, or Antifa. What a question there. I think, you know, I don't have to do much here to explain why that's significant, right? No, not at all. I mean, obviously, a question that you don't typically ask because a lot of those organizations, I don't care if you're Antifa or you're the Proud Boys, you're talking about organizations that have been alleged to have participated in criminal activity, at least their members have. So uh, I would be very hesitant if I were a member of one of those organizations and I would raise my hand because you might be implicating yourself. Okay, I'm just working through some of these questions. There's 41 of them. This is question 35. Have you read or listened to audio of any of the following books or podcasts by Michael Cohen or Mark Pomerantz? If so, please let us know if what you've heard or read affects your ability to be a fair and impartial juror. In this case, uh, he goes on to say, Disloyal, a memoir, you can check that box, or Revenge, the book, or Mea Culpa, the podcast, or The People versus Donald Trump. The book there. Uh, these are by either Michael Cohen or Mark Pomerantz, uh, who I would imagine might be called in to testify in this very trial. No, no question. Michael Cohen is the key witness for the prosecution. He is someone who is going to testify to this alleged hush money scheme. Now, of course, the defense is going to argue that he's an admitted liar, a convicted felon, but his statements are going to be critical, whether they're on the witness stands or in any of his written works, memoirs, books, otherwise. So if jurors have knowledge of those out-of-court statements, that's something that uh, the parties might want to consider in getting that juror removed. All right, so um, like we said, it seems like the timeline of this is moving along quite rapidly. Um, Judge Mershon said he hopes to have opening arguments start on Monday. I mean, that's a very ambitious 
time frame, would you agree? Is that ambitious, do you think? That is ambitious, but if we have two more days like today on Thursday and Friday, we're going to get there, Andrew. So if things keep moving quickly, we might have a jury and panel by the end of the week, if not early next week. And of course, uh, as we've been reporting, Wednesdays, uh, court will not meet. That's kind of the day yeah. off in, in this schedule here. Let's talk about Trump's demeanor and disposition today in court. Uh, Erica Orden, uh, who's with New York Politica, who covers all of the court's news there in New York so extensively, uh, with this observation, uh, Judge Mershon just admonished Trump, telling Blanche, that's Todd Blanche, Trump's uh, lead attorney, your client was audibly uttering something. I won't tolerate that. I will not have any jurors uh, intimidated in this courtroom. I want to make that crystal clear. How much uh, of a threat does Trump open himself up to, Nima, by even, you know, making, you know, facial cues or, or you know, clearing his throat or, or, or being, you know, minimally sarcastic in the slightest? Uh, how much of a threat does that open him up to for, you know, admonishment or even contempt? Well, Andrew, we talked about this a little yesterday. There's threats and there's empty threats. And uh, it will be telling to see if uh, Judge Merchant is actually going to do anything or just continuing admonishing the former president and his lawyer. Because I don't think Donald Trump is going to change his behavior. He is who he is. And in many ways, his success is due to him being who he is. And I don't think that, you know, the six to eight weeks that we sit through this trial is going to change Donald Trump. One important point I wanted to raise, though, is Trump's defense has done an outstanding job scouring the social media of the potential jurors. They had several jurors today who were removed for cause, which means that they didn't have to use one of their peremptories, and both sides have already used six out of ten. Trump's social media stalking, or at least his team stalking, has proven to be very fruitful in this trial. Yeah, you know, to that point, I want to highlight uh, how a juror was dismissed today because of their social media posts. <laughs> um, and, and it wasn't even a post having to do with, you know, something outright, say, pro or for or, or against Donald Trump. Uh, merely one of these prospective jurors uh, on the day of the election liked a video, I believe, on their Facebook page of kind of people cheering that Trump had lost the election. So it's getting into that minutia of social media posts, likes, uh, you know, retweets, shares, uh, and what have you. And so they've really done the yeoman's work there, trying to weed out and trying to get an impartial jury. Would you agree? Oh, I agree completely. And people might say something in that courtroom, say they can be fair and impartial, but if their social media posts and comments and likes tell a different story, that's someone that the judge may remove or cause, saving that peremptory. So really outstanding work by uh, the lawyers and the interns or the uh, social media consultants, whomever they've hired on the defense to yeah. ferret out those types of jurors. Nima, you know, about the jury, once it's selected, seated, uh, even some of the alternates, will we know them? Will we know kind of their profiles, their backgrounds? Will they be seen during the trial at all? Uh, you know, what is their role going to be other than, you know, obviously deciding Donald Trump's fate? Will we know anything about them? We will not. The judge has said that uh, the media pool, they can't identify them by name or give specific characteristics that may allow them to be named or doxxed. And my second biggest takeaway today, Andrew, is this. Two of those seven jurors, they're lawyers. Juror number two is a corporate lawyer, and juror number seven, I believe, is a civil litigator. Now, the conventional wisdom, if you are trying a case, is do not have lawyers on your panel. And this is why. Those lawyers will sway the entire jury pool. They have experience. They know what they're doing. So if you have a lawyer on your panel, Andrew, you better make sure they're on your side. Otherwise, you can easily lose the case. Okay, I just want to bring up some of the jury questions again, because I think that's so interesting. Jury question number 17 is this. Have you, a relative or close friend, ever had any education, training, or work experience in the legal field, including but not limited to practicing criminal or civil law? So clearly that question's not disqualifying, right? No, it's not disqualifying. That's a standard question okay. in every case in every courtroom in this country. Parties want to know, you know, this, is this someone that has 
substantive legal experience because what you're supposed to do if you are a lawyer who's also a juror is you're not supposed to bring your outside legal experience into the case you're supposed to judge the case solely on the facts and law in that case and listen to the jury instructions that the judge gives you but sometimes lawyers they like to be in control when when they're in that jury deliberation room they don't want to be one at 12 and that's the problem with having jurors on a panel you know, uh, lastly, Nima, I just want to bring up something we were discussing yesterday, the threat of contempt over violations of the gag order in place uh, on Donald Trump here. Uh, it seems like Alvin Bragg went a little further today with that. Uh, Fox News reporting that Bragg filed a motion to hold Trump in contempt for the alleged gag order violations and is threatening 30 days of jail time. How significant would that be? And do you foresee such a likelihood that Trump will be held in contempt? Obviously, he was admonished several times today in court, you know, for some of these sarcastic facial expressions. Uh, you know, obviously, we've seen Donald Trump for, what, almost 10 years. As a politician, he doesn't have much of a poker face, so to speak, here. So how is that different from this? It's not different. And, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday. You know, Donald Trump is being given a lot more leeway than any other litigant in any trial in American history. And the reason is this. No judge wants to take that unprecedented step of actually jailing a former president. I mean, a country would erupt in political upheaval. So if you're the judge, you're going to bark, but you're not going to bite. And you're going to do everything you can to keep the trial moving towards a verdict one way or the other. Try to keep Donald Trump in control to the best of your ability. But I don't think jailing him is actually going to happen. So then does Alvin Bragg understand or acknowledge or realize that, you know, when he's asking for something like this, that it is symbolic? It, it seems like the gag order, and we've been talking about this, is symbolic to all parties around here. You know, yes... Trump can maybe be fined three or five thousand dollars each time he violates it, you know. But Alvin Bragg's asking for jail time. Does he th actually think he's going to get jail time for a violation of a gag order? I don't think Alvin Bragg thinks he's going to get jail time. He's probably trying to uh, implicitly threaten the former president to try to keep him in line. But we know that uh, Donald Trump is going to do what Donald Trump is going to do. So okay. this is all. I'd say legal strategy uh, more than a substantive law in motion. I don't think Bragg or anyone realistically thinks that Trump will be actually imprisoned. Not going to happen. All right, Nina, lastly, what are you looking for? Not tomorrow, but when court reconvenes on Thursday. Obviously, they got some more jurors to select. What else? I'm looking for those jurors. Obviously, we got five more. The parties each have four peremptories. We're going to get six alternates. But the makeup of the jury matters a lot. And I'm mm -hmm. telling you, two out of seven being lawyers, that is atypical, not something you ever see in, in any other trial in this country. All right. Nima Romani, as always, uh, can't thank you enough. We'll talk soon, Nima. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. All right.